So I invite you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Around this mic. <clears throat> um, actually, I'm going to read another passage first, and we'll come back to this one. I want to go to the middle of the chapter in Luke chapter 13, uh, beginning with verse 22. And um, if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 22, we'll look at the background and lead up to this particular story here in uh, Luke chapter 13, but uh, follow along in your Bible. The uh, scriptures tell us this, Luke chapter 13, verse 22, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, were those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, well, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me all you workers of evil. In that place there will, be there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west, and from north and south, and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. We're continuing on in a series of sermons from the book of Luke. This has been a carryover from uh, some previous things that we've done. One of the things was asking ourselves the question, what is it like to live in the presence of God? About that time, Christmas came along, and of course, one of the names that we bandy about is Emmanuel, which means God with us. That name was given to Jesus. Jesus then bears the name Emmanuel, God with us. We then, who are followers of Jesus Christ, would say that, yes, we believe that he's present with us, that he's here on earth. He tells us that he is. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. However, I don't know that we really ask the question and give it a nuts and bolts answer. Like, what does it mean to get up in the morning in the presence of Jesus, what does it mean to go about our day, our, well, I wanted to say mundane, but maybe it's not so mundane. Maybe it's just very exciting for you. And, uh, but uh, whatever the activities of the day are, and to do so in, in the presence of God. <clears throat> this morning, uh, we want to look then uh, particularly at Luke chapter 13. But if we go back to Luke chapter 9, there's where Luke tells us that Jesus is beginning his journey to Jerusalem. That's important for us to understand. For one, this is the last time that Jesus is going to be going to Jerusalem. When Jesus arrives at his destination, that's the end. I mean, that's the end. He knows that. And so uh, Luke has been giving us kind of a timeline as Jesus makes these steps towards Jerusalem in different events and activities and so forth. Uh, when, when we think about this, though, uh, it's important for us to consider and, and, and to put ourselves in that context. This being an internet, well, I don't like to call it international church. I like to call it a local church that has a lot of foreign people in it. But uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of folks that, uh, that actually, actually live here and, and count this to be their home. But here's the thing. Almost every one of us have traveled here from somewhere. And even if this is your home, I feel fairly confident in saying you've all gone somewhere else first and also traveled back here. The reason I say that is because we need to understand in the time of Jesus, very few people actually traveled. 
I knew a guy, I, I was, I think, 17 years old. And my family, my dad's family is from Michigan. They were farmers up in Michigan. And I met a guy when I was 17 years old who had never, he was 30 years old, had never been out of his county. It just blew me away. I mean, here I am. I'm born in Taiwan. I've been back and forth to the U.S. several times. And this guy has never been out of his county. I didn't know that could be possible. But I began to think that, you know, in, in Jesus' time, that was very real. For example, very few people would have a horse. The only method of travel was going to be walking. And other than a religious pilgrimage of some sort, more than likely you did not travel or go anywhere very often. So the fact that Mary and Joseph had to go up to Bethlehem, uh, they would not have planned this as being, hey, Mary, let's go take a holiday up in Bethlehem, shall we? And they wouldn't have planned it that way. There had to be some kind of event or activity that would move them that, in that direction. So <clears throat> we need to realize that as early as the 19th century, only the idle rich from England could afford the time and money to visit even the sites of Europe. Most of the world, for most of human history, most people didn't travel at all. So when we see Luke telling us about this trip that Jesus is taking, and, and, and he traveled from that little tiny village of Nazareth, he got around quite a bit, but still pretty much located in Palestine in that area, and still pretty much just uh, in this small, very, uh, just a very small sphere of influence. Luke used this journey then to show us where Jesus is going. Another thing that we need to understand about this time in which we're talking about is um, what kind of mm, environment or situation that they're in. I've heard many people say to me, and I would be the first one to agree, and oftentimes I would be the first one to say so, it's kind of nice living in Taiwan. Don't you agree? If you don't agree, hey, there's the door. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, nobody's keeping you here. So, uh, and, and, but I... Having said that, I would also be the first one to admit my own frustrations from living in Taiwan. But I don't blame it on living in Taiwan. I blame it on living life. I mean, there's crazy people everywhere you go, so, and, and that's just life. So, uh, but Taiwan's a nice place. And one of the things that I particularly like about Taiwan is that it's quite a, a secure place. Uh, we're not in any fear of violence or, or terrorism. Uh, we have uh, people who want to demonstrate against nuclear power plants and so forth. And, you know, I mean, bless them. Uh, it's a good privilege to be able to do that and, 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 and fine. But uh, other than that, we, we just don't... Taiwan's a very peaceful, lovely place to live. And we might want to project that into the time of Jesus Christ, and that would be absolutely wrong to do. There was this great conflict that's going on between the Jews and the Romans. And um, we see in, in uh, Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, Luke mentions some of these events. Somebody begins to ask Jesus about the news events of some things that have happened. He talks there. He says, there were some present at that time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, and he said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the power, a tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? And Jesus replies, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So we have these two events that are, that are, uh, are mentioned. The first one there about the Galileans and, and Pilate mixing the blood of the Galileans. These were Jews who had come up from Galilee. As far as the Jews in Jerusalem were concerned, they were kind of, you know, they're, um, uh, they're kind of the rough and tumble guys. They're just not quite so mm, sophisticated as, as we city people are, you know, we Jerusalem people. We, we, we have all these things. And, and uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard in Taiwan about people who up in Taipei talk about the southerners, you know. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, you want to you, you have a discussion, you talk about the tourists coming over from China. Uh, there's a big argument in Hong Kong about this, this tourist in China who allowed her boy to, 
anyway, uh, you'd have to read the news. You have to read the news to get that one. Anyway, I, I'm simply saying that that we had these ideas and attitudes about people, and so that was that was there too. However. There was this general animosity between the Jews and the Romans. And, and at this time when Jesus was there, it's deepening. It's becoming more violent. And, and so we need to understand that much of what Jesus has to say about the danger that's coming has to do with the, the conflict between the Jews and the Rome, Romans. So we need to be also be careful that, that we don't then automatically extract it and make application to our days. There, there's good reason to do so, but bear with me because when we look at this, we, we see that this fierce hatred is becoming more intense. Uh, a um, historian by the name of Josephus, he records some very serious travesties of justice. That took place even during Jesus' time. Uh, for example, there's a, and the, the Romans were very distrustful of the Jews. 400 years of silence between Malachi and the beginning of the Gospels, the time when Jesus came here. There was a major rebellion, uh, the Maccabean Rebellion that took place, uh, and, and it, was, uh, it was nasty. Thousands of people got killed. This is still kind of fomenting there. They're so afraid of, the Romans are so afraid of sedition. And when all these Jews are getting together in the temple for one, one of their worships, uh, one of their uh, ceremonies, then, you know, this is how it goes. People begin talking, and they say, well, either the Romans this, the Romans that. Wish we were our own country again. Wish we were the great Jewish kingdom again. Wish our king was back. And now, you see, we have a guy on the scene who claims to be king. He claims to be from the line of David. I know some people believe it, and they accept him. And, and some of the crowds, there's thousands of people who throng a, around this guy named Jesus. But then there are those who in authority say, nah, he doesn't look and act like a king. So uh, there's this going on. And, and Josephus tells the story. And he says, he sent out the whole army upon them and sent the horsemen to prevent those that had their tents without the temple from assisting those that were within the temple and to kill such as ran away from the footmen when they thought themselves out of danger, which the horsemen slew 3,000 men while the rest went into neighboring mountains. This is just one of the several uh, events that he wrote about. I, I say this, 3,000 people. So if 3,000 people met their death because of the military or because of the police in this city, do you think that that would be news? Yes, it would be. And we have 20, what, uh, 12 million, something like that in this town? Uh, so if you, if you consider Jerusalem at the time had much smaller population, and it would have expanded because of all the pilgrims that had come into town, 3,000 people losing their life, and then, to make things worse, they pile the corpses within the courtyard of the temple. So that's just, you know, somebody needs to teach them how to make friends and, and, and influence their enemies and so forth because they're not doing very good at it. This is really, it's, it's a big deal. So this is what's going on. These, these wild and terrible collisions, they're, they're quite frequent. And, and um, they're the particular person that's causing this, these is the guy named Pilate. And you'll remember, uh, you'll, we'll find out as we go on that, at the end of Jesus' journey in Jerusalem, he's going to meet up with this guy named Pilate who's been killing the Jews. But the interesting thing is this. Uh, those very people who hate Pilate are screaming out to crucify Jesus. And Pilate says, crucify the king of the Jews. And these people come screaming back, we have no king but Caesar. Oh, boy. That's, that's absolutely profound. But that's another story for another time. So, the thing is this, <clears throat> from the end of chapter 12, Jesus has been talking and warning the Jews about going down this path of a confrontation with Rome. He knows it's not going to, to come out well. In fact, is Jesus knows that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And, and the language that he uses does not fit comfortably with the peaceful and kind Christianity we like to portray today. Uh, for example, if we're to go back to chapter 12, let me just um, uh, bring this out to you real quick. The last part of chapter 12, beginning with verse 49, here's what he said. This is Jesus saying, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. 
I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? I mean, isn't that what the angel said? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. I mean, that's how they announced the birth. And now here Jesus says, do you think that I have come to announce peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And so he says to them, you guys, you need to see what the time is. You need to understand what's going on in in this time and and to, to understand the times in which they're in. So this language that he uses is... It's not what we typically like to, how we like to identify ourselves as Christians. But Jesus is trying to, uh, to teach his followers that when we begin to live according to the precepts, the laws, and the behavior, and the teachings of Jesus Christ, you know what's going to happen, folks? We're going to come heads up, right against opposition, right against trouble, right against uh, heartache and, and, and anger and and animosity. Some of you may have experienced it already. And you may cry out and you say, well, God, I thought you were the God of peace. He is. And peace will come. But as we strive to be more like Jesus, we'll see that there's going to be uh, an accompaniment of, of great distress because the problems that we face in society, the problems that we face in our culture, the problems of politics, religion, and people, as hard as we try, we're not going to be able to solve it with human effort. It's not going to be solved by human effort. And that message doesn't go over too well. It doesn't mean that we should quit. It just means that Jesus, when in in, in this context of, of, of this great chaos and this milieu of anger and angst and stuff that's going on around him, he's saying to these Jewish people, listen, Your hope and aspiration of bringing the kingdom back is not, it's not going to be realized. You're going to be crushed by these Romans. So he's pleading for Israel to return to worshiping and obeying the one true God, Yahweh. You see, folks, we have great ideas. We have great aspirations. We have great hopes in which we want to see accomplished. But if we're not in in tune and in line with God, and, and if he's not working in and through us, we're going to be frustrated. They're focused on trying to restore their autonomy and their kingdom in their own power, in their own ability, by their own planning. The Maccabean revolt was, was crushed, and, and they're trying to do this again, and Jesus is saying, no, don't. And, and he says, follow me, follow me. The result is this. The Jews refused to follow him. Jesus cries and his pleas fell on, on, on deaf ears. They don't believe him. And here's what happened. Thousands of Jews perished in the last terrible war by the swords of the Roman legionnaires. Just like those Galileans that they talked about in the first part of Luke chapter 13. Not a few met their death in the capital of Jerusalem amongst the ruins of the burning fallen houses. We know that Jerusalem in its entirety was completely destroyed. The loss of life in that siege and especially in its closing scenes, is just incalculable. We just don't know how many died. And within the 40 years of Jesus speaking these words, it happened. It happened. What's the answer? Jesus tells us this, and you, it's, it's, for many of us it might be just, well, that's too simplistic, Pastor. It just doesn't work that easy. It's not my answer, okay? Don't get upset with me. Jesus said, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. When he says likewise perish, he's talking about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed and mixed their blood with the sacrifices. It's a religious deal, religious thing. It's a political thing. And he's saying that, you know, you're going to perish too unless you repent. And what does that mean? It means you've got to change your ways. You have to change your ways to, to and, and he's saying to them, there, to follow him. There has to be a renouncing of sin. There has to be a turning away from living in sin. In other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ has to change one's direction and therefore their behavior. I put it like this. There is no such person 
who can claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, whose life, aim, and behavior is not fundamentally changed by the presence of Jesus Christ in their life. We talk about this thing called easy believism. I believe in it. I believe it's very easy to believe. But the Bible talks about repentance. Repentance simply means to be going one direction and to go back the other direction. The Chinese word for repent is excellent. Hui gai. It just simply means to turn direction. To be going one direction, the hui gai just means you just turn around and go, you, 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 you're going completely the other direction. We don't really get that in the, in the English word, but that's exactly what it means. And Jesus is saying, if we're going to have, if we're going to be salt and light in this generation, if we're going to effect change, then there has to be this repentance. And then he goes on to tell them, there's only a limited time to repent. We have to do so when we have the opportunity. God is merciful. Yes, he is, but his mercy can be shunned. And the bottom line is the gift that God has given to us of salvation there is a limit. There is a limit. That gift will not forever and ever be offered for all of eternity. He gives us a parable, and he talks about this. And again, this goes in the next passage of, um, of uh, Luke. Luke chapter 13, and uh, Jesus goes right into this, this um, parable about a fig tree. Verse 6, he says, and he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered, this is the gardener answered, and says, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. But if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. He pleads for the gardener pleads for another year on this. And Jesus is saying that repentance is what's necessary. Repentance without works is like a fruit tree without fruit. Repentance without some kind of evidence behind it, it's like a, a fruit tree that has no evidence that it's a fruit tree. Like, why is it taking up ground here? What kind of evidence should be it? evidence of repentance? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 tells us, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So one of the fruit, then, that he's talking about here for this true tree, and when he goes to this fig tree and he sees no fruit on it, he says, cut it down. So the gardener says, no, let me dig around it and, and put fertilizer around there, and the word is manure, and uh, let me give it another year. Uh, the thing is this, folks. Uh, God, God's very merciful. Sometimes his mercy stinks. I mean that. It just really stinks. It's manure. It's things we don't like in our life. It's difficulties. It's hardships. It's like, ah, why me? How come I have to do this? How come life can't be a little bit easier for me? We just kind of plug through and we just and it, it's difficult on our relationship with God too, because it's like, ah, you know, God, I do love you. I mean, can you show me a little slack here? Can you give me some give me something here? And 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 still there's more manure. And uh, and it stinks. When I was a kid growing up here in Taiwan, um, we never ate lettuce. There's a reason why we never ate lettuce, because at that time they used human fertilizer. And uh, not humans, but human fertilizer, okay? <laughs> so bear with me, all right? Uh, I, I lived in those times. might sound terrible to you, but we didn't have a flushing toilet. It was one of those toilets that emptied into a pit. And so every now and then, every a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, then uh, the honey buckets come by. And it's got its 
the guy's got this thing on the back of an ox cart, comes rolling up, and he brings his buckets in, and he empties out our cesspit and fills his buckets and takes out and puts in his things. And it stinks. It stinks. You could always tell what time of the season was by the, time, by the smell as you went out into the fields. It was a fertilizing time. I mean, it was horrible. And if the wind was blowing the wrong way, it was just disgusting because this is before the time in Taiwan that they had uh, the artificial chemical fertilizers and they used human waste. So in order for us to eat lettuce, my mother would soak it in uh, uh, bleach. So <laughs> what's the point of having lettuce anyway? I mean, it's supposed to be really good for you. Just, you <laughs> just uh, and, and we had to be really, we had to be very, very careful. And that's why, too, that uh, even in Chinese cooking, usually it's very hot, intensely hot for a very short period of time. And, and that's how they uh, cook their vegetables and so forth and get rid of, uh, of those things. So dysentery, and that, that it, was, it was rampant. And we always had to be careful. We, I don't know, for us, I went around barefoot all the time and had worms most of my life. But that's just part of growing up in here. So when I say I like Taiwan, hey, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. Taiwan is very, very nice. It didn't used to be this way. But the, th the thing is, this, this gardener says, here, let me, let me just dig around this tree. and Let me put uh, the fertilizer, the manure around it. And it stinks and it's hard, but it's a merciful thing. And, and the idea is, is that through these experiences, then, it's going to bring forth fruit. You see, the other thing about uh, bringing forth fruit is disciples. Disciples reproduce. It's expected that we as followers of Jesus Christ should also reproduce followers of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus said to us when he was leaving earth. He said, go into all the earth, go into all the world, go to every nation and make disciples. Last command. So one of the things that he's expecting from us is that we would reproduce the life and the, and, and the character of Jesus Christ and others because of what he's done for us. And, and if there's not the reproducing going done, then the owner of the garden says, sorry, you're just taking up ground that should be reproducing. Cut it out. Take it out. Jesus is saying that that's why repentance is necessary. And then he goes on down in the last part of this chapter here uh, and the passage that we read. He says there, strive to enter through the narrow door. Y you know, <clears throat> I, have, I, I know what this is saying, but it's just, it's not really easy for me to say it because, you know, we Christians, we're accused of being exclusive. It's our way or the highway. In fact, it's, it's Jesus' way or there's no way. I mean, Jesus is the one way. This is what we say. And, and there's just a whole lot of people in this world that don't like that. And, you know, honestly, with all my heart, with all my heart, I wish I could say, oh, you know, you're right. I, you, you're absolutely right. There's, there's really many different ways. But if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I, I can't say that. I just can't. And so I would be remiss then to even fudge a little bit on that truth and say, well, you know, maybe I can't do that. Why? Because this is what Jesus is saying to us. He's making it very, very clear here. He's saying that there's only one way, that it's a narrow way. And <clears throat> We're, we are uh, only claiming for Christianity what Jesus has proclaimed to us. So what can we do? Well, I, I really believe then that what we need to do is to show compassion. Just this past week, I heard some comments made by uh, uh, another missionary, a fellow missionary. Uh, he was out playing basketball. And here's what he said, we crushed those Mormons. Well, I know, it's just good, solid competition. I have, honestly, it just rubbed me the wrong way. And, and, and you, might think, you might think, well, Dave, you're becoming a flaming liberal. No. The reason is, I do believe that Jesus is the only way. But I'm going to tell you what, folks, that kind of language is not going to make any headway to getting other people to understand that we're followers of Jesus Christ. When we kind of go say, hey, I'm on the inside and you're on the outside. We crushed you. Instead of going and saying to them, hey, I want to I, I be, I want to learn 
I, I, what you're about and so forth. Not because I want to change, but because somehow, some way, I want to convince you. And, and this, it's the same thing true with, especially when we talk about the, the heathen religions and, and so forth. And You know, I, I don't believe that Buddhists are going to heaven. From what I know, Buddhists don't be, they don't even care about going to heaven. Not what's on their mind. But Jesus says there's only one way. It's the narrow way. And the question that was put to Jesus was this. Are there only going to be a few people who are saved? Now, that's a good question, don't you think? I mean, look at us here. I, I, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm just pleased as punch that we got this many people here today. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit later after this meeting about how we can get more people here. I just, you know, to me, I think the more the better. But what kind of impact? you think that Christianity is having on this world today? I mean, are we just, is this a slam dunk? Are we just crushing the opposition? My, my perception is, is that we kind of, we're, it's like the darkness is coming down upon us and we're, we're, we're trying to push back the darkness all the time instead of being light. Just be light. Darkness has never overcome the light. Even in a dark room, you light a, 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 a match. Darkness never puts out the match. Light always overcomes the darkness. And so we need to understand that we should, we need to be the light. But we need to be very careful about strutting our exclusivity. While we, we believe it, we have to believe what Jesus says when he says there is only one door and it's a narrow door. The rabbis taught that God offered salvation to all who had born into the Jewish race. And so you have this conversation in which Jesus is, is uh, having with these, these religious people. And the fact is the guy who asked him, are just a few people going to be saved? That's another thing, the whole saved issue. Uh, the reason I say that is because I, I find in my conversation that the use of religious language is really off-putting. Do you, do you find that? Do, do you find that? Uh, if you, you begin to talk to somebody, well, are you saved? And they're going like, what? You know, and, and so uh, I've kind of back, tried to back off from using the, the, the religious language and try to use a language that, that's not so off-putting and, and so forth. And, and not just because I want to be pleasing and happy to everybody, but I just would like to have a conversation without people getting upset because of the words that I use. And, and just... Okay, I'm a pastor. I told you. I don't even like to use the word pastor. As soon as I say I'm a pastor, the conversation stops. <laughs> I, I, it's, just, it's, just the word that we, it's just the way we live in. I mean, it's like going into another country and, and trying to... Um, <laughs> yeah, you know how it is when you go to another country and you try to speak their language and you say the stupidest things, you know? And, and the, you're trying so hard to communicate, you know, and you're... Just laughing at you, I, I had that I had that many times in Hong Kong when I was trying to preach in Cantonese. I've told you some of these stories, but <laughs> I was preaching this whole time about the about the world, the prince of the world, and uh, my son who grew up in the Chinese schools came up to me and goes, "Dad, how come you were preaching about the prince of the chickens?" He goes, you know, because uh, the, wor the word for world is saigai. The word for small chicken is saigai. <laughs> <And if, laughs> so all this time I'm talking about saigai, and he's going, the, the prince of the chickens, and he, the prince of the little chicks, actually. And so <laughs> he, he, words are important. And I believe as Christians, as people who hold the message and the hope of, of this world, we need to be careful of language, and we need to be careful that when we speak our language that other people understand the lingo that we're using, and sometimes they look at us like, oh, I don't even know what you're talking about. And, and so it, it takes that effort there. And, and the other tendency that we have today is, as a society and even as Christians, uh, we have this sense of entitlement. Entitlement. That just kind of uh, ticks me off. And, and it particularly ticks me off when foreigners come to this country with this sense of uh, in, entitlement. Uh, and 
since I grew up here, you know, I, I, um, yeah, I, I see it, and uh, it's kind of funny sometimes. But the thing is, I think that we Christians need to be very careful about this entitlement issue too, because we get this, we can get this idea that, hey, I'm going to heaven. I must be because I'm good enough and I earned it, and uh, and hence we have this us and them attitude, you know, uh, us saved. You, heathen. And that, uh, that just doesn't go over very well at all. Yes, saved by the grace of God. Thank you. Thank the Lord. But for God's grace, I would walk in, 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 in shoes of, of, of doubt and, and, and misunderstanding. So here's, in this story, and again, and I, I should probably uh, read it to you uh, from, um, from Luke. And that is uh, the one about the narrow door. And here's what he says on verse 22. We, we, we read this passage as we, were, as we uh, started the uh, service today. Uh, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone, whoever that is, somebody just interrupts him because he's, he's teaching here. He says, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Notice, Jesus doesn't really answer the question, does he? He says in reply, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For I tell you, uh, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So there's some things that we can learn from this story that I, I, about this narrow door that I think are very important for us to understand. And the first one is this. No one gets to heaven accidentally. No one gets to heaven accidentally. You know, we talk about falling in love. <laughs> Really? Who falls in love? And, and maybe it's just me. I'm sorry. If it is just me, maybe you have fallen heads over heels in love. You're just, you're in this free fall, you know. Um, <laughs> the thing is that with this small door, this narrow door, Jesus says that we're to strive to enter through it. What does that word strive mean? That word strive is agonizomai, agonizomai, which we get our English word, agonize, agonize. In other words, we're, there's, there's to be an effort. Now, wait, I thought salvation was free. I thought I can't make that effort. I thought it was all done for me. Hey, listen, uh, it is. Who provided the door? Who made the door? Who opens the door and beckons us? But you, know, but you see, here's the thing is, it's not like Jesus is out there and he's grabbing and snatching this person, that person, bringing us in, kicking and screaming against our will. Somewhere along the line, we have to make some kind of decision. Somewhere along the line, we, we have to be convinced. And, and so he's not describing that we enter in through works, our own works. What he is saying is that there is a narrow door. That means there is a specific route it's a narrow route, and we have to strive to find it. Here's what Matthew chapter 7 says, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide. The way is easy that leads to destruction. Those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So you see, there. There is this, this striving to, to find that gate. Don't, don't you know people who are kind of wondering about the meaning of life? Don't you know people who say, you know, I, 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 I think there's somebody called God, but how do I know? Do, do you know people who, who struggle with the whole spiritual aspect of life? These are people who are striving. These are people who need to know where the door is. These are people who need for us to say, listen, let me point you to Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. So this kind of striving and agonizing and thinking and doubting and questioning and so forth, th that's all part of it. It's necessary. And Jesus says, strive to enter in at the narrow gate. If you have questions about your faith and you have doubts about your faith and you're wondering about this guy named Jesus, hey, keep it up. Keep wondering. Keep looking. Keep studying. Keep looking into it. And until, and I believe this, that Jesus will convince us.
too often. I, I read two things this week I was reading about. One, I read uh, Dallas Willard was writing the forward of a book. Uh, I think it was for Scott Knight. These two guys are very, oh man, they're great writers. It's very interesting to me because both of them mention the same kind of experience that I had as uh, um, coming from a very, very strict, strict background. And both of them come from, uh, well, from, they come from fundamentalist uh, uh, background. And, and I, I, I really appreciate the fundamentalists because, you know, they're, they're out there and they're, they're, they're working hard at it. And I, I appreciate them very much. But here's, here's the problem that I have, and that is that here's what they said. This was um, Dallas Willard said, man, when he became a teenager, he, he was introduced to Jesus Christ. And man, bam, he got saved. He asked Jesus Christ into his heart. So the first thing he was told is, you got to read your Bible. And he did. He began reading his Bible regularly. Loved it. Then the other thing, you got to pray. He began to pray regularly. Then the other thing was, you got to go witnessing. So on Tuesday nights, they had witnessing time for the church. And the first time he went witnessing, he, they had a little class there, and he went out with the, the head deacon in the church, and they went witnessing. They came to the door and knocked on the door, and uh, this guy that th answered the door, he had a napkin tucked in his um, uh, belt there, and he was still chewing food, and so obviously it was, he had just gotten up from the dinner table, and, and uh, he had visited the church the Sunday before, so the deacon introduced himself and began to tell him about the church and then ask him about uh, his spiritual condition, and it was pretty obvious that the guy wanted to get back to dinner. But uh, the deacon was going to get him saved. And so they got inside, and for two hours they talked with the guy. And finally, after two hours, he's, he, he prayed a prayer. And uh, the reason I, I mentioned it, Dallas Willard said as a young kid, he said, I, I, I just didn't get it. Because we went back home after, after this guy, and the, the, the rest of the family had finished their dinner. They had cleaned the table. They had washed all the dishes. And this guy's still here. And finally, he said the prayer. And we went out, man, we're just pumping our hands and go back and we share with everybody that we got one, you know. And, and Dallas was simply saying, he was expressing his own, his own consternation with this is that, did we? Because he never came back to church again. Never saw him there. And so the thing is, is the, the question that Dallas was asking is, are, are we just trying to make converts or are we trying to make disciples? There's a big difference. Jesus says, make disciples. And that's what he's telling us here, that this, this, there's coming a time when the door is going to close. But we need to, be, we need to be interested in making disciples who are also going to follow Jesus and be discipling others.